<laughs> Can you hear me okay? All right. um, hello everybody, my name is Luke Cooperhouse. This is a session that got added uh, a little bit last minute. Uh, I'm not the uh, other presenter that was on the schedule, that, if you had the printed schedule. Um, I'm the, uh, one of the co-founders and also the CEO of a company called Blue Nalu. And we're here today to talk about this uh, exciting category of cell-based seafood. So is everybody here in the right session? That's good. Um, I thought maybe just a little uh, starting point, um, you know, why is this category exciting? Um, so I'm going to pass around just one of our, one of our earlier brochures here, but it really talks about the, the whole challenge that we have in our, in our seafood economy um, and this challenges in our, in our supply chain. So I'll pass some out this way. If you could pass them back, that'd be awesome. And the same here. You got it. So what this, what this brochure talks about is uh, some of the challenges that we have in our global seafood supply chain. Um, I think as we all know, the global demand for seafood is at an all-time high, exceeding 20 kilograms per capita globally. US, Asia, and EU are leading the, the planet uh, in consumption. That's really great news for the seafood industry. Um, but we all know what the challenge is, the global supply is, uh, is disappearing. Overfishing, climate change effects, acidification, um, illegal fishing, uh, and uh, many environmental factors are, are really causing, um, let's leave that in the back, thank you, are really causing uh, a, a, a disappearing of our supply chain. Um, but what's actually even worse is the, the supply chain that, uh, that remains. Let me put down the back chair if you don't mind, thank you. Um, so, we, you know, maybe, maybe throw your hand up, what are some of the issues we have in, in the seafood that we consume every day? Mercury, uh, you know, even for, certainly for pregnant breastfeeding women, but even for adult men, uh, there's recommendations to limit your intake of, of tuna. Plastic. Microplastics is a huge issue. There's uh, a really interesting infographic of, uh, of a decomposed bottle going into a fish, going into a human. You know, so this whole, this whole uh, it's an interesting graphic on, on how this is all getting to our body. And there's a couple studies that show that there's up to 10,000 microplastic pieces that are consumed uh, in the average person's diet. Obviously very small. We don't know the effects, long-term effects of this, but that's certainly a big issue. Fraud, Fraud is a huge issue. So actually Oceana did a, a survey on, on uh, the seafood industry. Uh, by way of background, I come out of Campbell Soup, Nestle, Conagra. I've been involved with a number of startups. I, I ran a, uh, a food incubation program at Rutgers for a number of years, a lot of consulting. Um, but in my whole career, I've never seen an industry that's so fraught with fraud as seafood. Um, I think the Oceana survey said that it up to, I think it was 87% of, I think it was Red Snapper, is, uh, and tuna is right behind it, like 70% are inadvertently or you know, purposefully fraudulent, you know, and in part because the whole supply chain, look at the world, um, you're catching fish, you're not even sure what you're catching, you can't really identify it, you're passing it to the next guy, to the next guy, it ends off in a plate, you know, you know perhaps filleted or not, and it's just really challenging to begin with. Other issues that we all know about in the seafood supply chain, obviously environmental pollutants, toxins, parasites, pathogens, uh, even the FDA has identified that the number one product that import in the United States that is uh, refused, that entry, is seafood. Uh, because of uh, w whether it could be adulterated or whether it's because it is actually contaminated in some way or there's not proper traceability record keeping. Um, so there's a lot of issues there. Another thing that's really uh, a, a challenge in our seafood supply chain is price. Um, so the seafood industry um, is, you know, obviously because of the the, the disparity of the supply chain has products that uh, are, are available sometimes a year um, and, the, and the price fluctuates dramatically. So what if one could manufacture seafood um, that actually could even out the supply chain, could not only deal with all the consumer challenges we talked about, but also could be humane for animals, no animals killed. So animal suffering is certainly a big issue with many consumers today. Um, but uh, so the opportunity for seafood in our opinion, is far more, far stronger than exists in any of the protein sector. Um, so again, my name is Luke Cooperhouse, um, co-founder, CEO of Blunalu. Uh, we'll have Chris Samoji speak in a minute, who's our chairman. 
uh, and, and, and the founder of this company. Uh, anybody know what the word Nalu means? So Nalu is actually a Hawaiian word for wave. You got the, you got the motion. <laughs> so we actually founded the company in Hawaii. Uh, Chris was the head of a venture capital firm in Hawaii at the time. Uh, and I was actually pitching to a uh, agricultural foundation event, uh, not pitching, but doing a, a trans overview in Hawaii. And uh, our third co-founder, Chris Damon, um, joined our team. But what we recognized was the first issue in this industry is this is hard. Um, how do we bring together the talents and expertise that's needed to be successful in this co very complex category? Um, so I'll let Chris introduce himself next, but my background is all food innovation, commercialization, um, being involved with uh, operating a lot of companies, everything from a $100 million fresh cut produce company where I was a president, uh, to being a VP of R&D at a Nestle funded startup doing some new technologies and even pioneering gluten free products back in the uh, mid 90s before there was a category. So really the whole opportunity to be in the disruptive food space has never been stronger than it is in cell based seafood. So we're quite excited um, and maybe Chris can maybe jump in and talk about himself and his background and kind of uh, uh, his pioneering efforts that go back a good 10 years um, as well. Chairman of Blue Nally. Uh, my background is in bioengineering, and in fact, about uh, 12 years ago, I founded, uh, ran, and sold one of the first tissue engineering uh, companies in the space of uh, dental tissue engineering to regrow parts of food. I got kind of excited about that. Uh, when I worked for intellectual ventures, I had a chance to pitch this concept of clean meat to Bill Gates. Uh, at the time, he thought it was a really stupid idea, actually. Um, and he said, Well, who thought of this? Uh, it's a tough thing to hear from someone like him. But uh, he warmed up, and so now as you know, he's the of it. So I put all this together and decided it was kind of time to see what we could do in the seafood space. Um, so Blue Mallow brought together background in, a deep background in the food the manufacturing world, blue, and my background in tissue engineering, and venture capital, and entrepreneurship, and our third partner. Uh, cell biologist, uh, deep background in tissue engineering as well. Over 100 years of experience. Uh, our current uh, technical team is actually, uh, our scientific team is all female, 100%. Uh, we're based in San Diego. We're based in San Diego because it's kind of one of the tissue engineering capitals of the world. We believe that this technology really emanates from the medical side of things. Um, proof of concept on the medical side has been amazing. People have been printing and growing bladders, blood vessels, kidneys, livers, all kinds of amazing things going on. So um, that's a much higher bar. That's got to work in a body and not kill anybody. Here we need essentially something that's dead uh, and, and just to be flavorful and nutritious. We love seafood because unlike the, the plant, unlike the uh, land-based animals, where there's well, it's sort of less than 10 animals we consume. In the seafood world, it's hundreds and hundreds of different species uh, across different classes of animal, uh, animals, mollusks, um, echinoderms, fish. But right now, we're focusing on fish. We're kind of species agnostic. Although, if you're working in mollusks or crustaceans or fish, it's definitely different worlds. Um, the, uh, the kind of data that was available to the meat and poultry people uh, was definitely more lavish than what we encountered when we started. Uh, there's lots of studies, lots of markers, lots of cell lines available for the beef and poultry and the swine world. It's almost nothing in uh, the seafood world. So we've had to invent a lot of things ourselves, including our own markers. Uh, but we're making great progress. So we've got our, our first tens of millions of cells growing. One of the, the approaches that we're doing, which is a little different from others, um, we're definitely not doing any genetically modified approach, so we believe in that seriously. Um, but we also think that it's important if you're going to provide muscle cells, that uh, in fact you were reproducing muscle cells. Many other companies are starting with fibroblasts. These are the ones that produce connective tissue. Because they're very easy to mass produce. So you take some of those, mass produce them, it's only at the last step, you hit them with some morphogens to convert them to muscle cells. It sort of works, but it's really it's a last-minute transition. Right? We start with muscle cells from the very beginning, have been able to get them to reproduce in, in 
uh, quite large quantities, uh, multiple, multiple cycles. So that means that these cells have been muscle cells from the get-go, producing muscle-related proteins from the get-go. Uh, so we're excited about that, and we'll have a little announcement about that in a few weeks uh, at the conference here in the manufacturing. The other thing that we're committed to, in fact, is manufacturing, because we think proof of principle has been long established in the medical realm and now in the food realm. Um, it's really a question of scale. Can we deliver the, the quantities the world would like at the price point they want, as an earlier uh, speaker mentioned, as Bruce mentioned. Um, so this really becomes an interesting challenge. Um, unlike the plant-based folks, we need specialized equipment and specialized factory layouts that don't really exist. Right? So if I were making cupcakes or or pizza dough, I could go to the hundred people and ask them to make some We have to kind of design our own stuff. So that becomes an interesting financial challenge and design challenge and design process. So we have recently hired a vice president of process engineering uh, with a deep background in uh, cell work in the pharma world, uh, and we are very actively designing our, our first plans for this. Um, yeah, we have many similar challenges as, as some of the other folks do in terms of driving down the input costs, media costs. Um, we have our own techniques that we're, we're pleased with so far, and uh, we expect that to continue. I just want to, yeah, I think as Chris talked about, uh, you know, we, we want to use this uh, opportunity to kind of create some exchange and answer some questions. And um, for those of you considering this business to get into, happy to give you some counsel. The Good Food Institute has been uh, a huge, uh, huge fan. I only have a few copies, but those of you who haven't seen it yet, this is their Ocean of Opportunity uh, paper that you can download it online. But if anyone wants to print a copy, first hands up, I have about six or seven. Um, but uh, it's a really nice uh, white paper on, um, uh, and you know, on uh, one more. There you go. It's a really nice white paper that really talks about anybody else wants. Uh, that really talks about the whole category of, of both plant-based and cell-based foods. Uh, so Liz Beck from GFI is a big contributor there. Um, but the GFI team is just an awesome resource for all of you to really look at whether your interest is plant-based or cell-based. They're very different worlds. The consumer may be similar, but the consumer may change over time once cell-based and plant-based are both in the market. So it's, it's quite, you know, the, the industry is very immature. If you look at a plant-based category, there's, uh, uh, there's not a really firm number, but it feels like just shy of a, of a billion dollars has been invested in plant-based. Apostle Foods, it's in, the, it's in the public domain, has raised over 400 million. Beyond's about to do an IPO. Um, a lot of other companies uh, have, you know, have done a little less than that. But all in, it's around, you know, just shy of a billion. And a cell-based category is shy of 100 million. It might be shy of 60 million. Um, so Memphis Meats and most of the meats obviously have, have done an A-Ram. Um, we've actually had the largest seed round uh, in the category. and. Uh, all of us, including ourselves, will be growing in the, in the near term. Um, so we're quite excited at the opportunity that cell base that needs a lot more venture investments to really help it realize its potential. And I think we'll see more strategic investors come in this space as well. So as Chris, as Chris talked about, the whole goal of anybody in this category is scale production. And that's been our focus from day one. That's the team we've, we've, we've created. Um, so we're already designing what a factory looks like. It's a very complicated ordeal, uh, but it's a, if you don't have the end in mind, you'll never get there. So I think with that as just kind of an overview, um, we'll also be adding to our team in the near future too. Um, we're, at, we're moving to a new location. Um, and uh, anybody interested in potential positions uh, down the road, feel free to reach out to us as well. Um, Maybe just one more thing to add. Um, we also have an interesting opportunity in the seafood world that I think the land-based folks uh, don't quite have, which is that among those hundreds of species of people, here, several of them have kind of been pulled away from the menu because of overfishing, so fisheries have actually collapsed. I'll give you a great example. There's a fish here on the West Coast called yellow-eyed rockfish. It lives to almost 200 years old. It really can't be farmed. Uh, it was very tasty, and people loved it. So if you go back to restaurant menus in the 30s and 40s, you'll see it frequently cited. But overfish collapsed, not available. Small number of sports fishermen licenses, 
and that's it. So we have the opportunity to sort of revive uh, culinary experiences that have sort of disappeared and to further extend these programs with fresh pork. That's never been but it can I, th I think just uh, so one last comment too. I think we're so excited, as you can tell by this opportunity. Not only can we have mercury-free tuna, but if I'm a chef at a restaurant, I could have boneless fish, headless, tailless fish, no cross-contamination fish, fully yielded fish. Uh, so it's a total you know, it's a paradigm shift. It's also it's a it's a demand-driven model, not a supply-driven model. No longer does fish need to come from, the, you know hopefully from the boats out of Thailand to New York City, now it can come from you know, New York metropolitan area making a product you know, you know, made for the local market. So this is a real game changer. Uh, you know, Bruce actually from GFI has actually called cell-based meat um, you know, the equivalent of, of Henry Ford you know, having an automobile replacing you know, a, a carriage, horse-strong carriage. This, is, this has the potential to absolutely change the entire protein industry in a major way. So. I'm um, happy to take any questions you all have. Sir. How long until you think you're going to have food uh, on grocery shelves? <laughs> grocery. Um, the question was how long until we have food on the grocery shelves. So that's a question that all of us are, are working with. But I think the, the general rule that people have, have said in industry is in the three to five year time frame. So in our case, we have a five phase growth strategy. So. Uh, in, in the year 2019, we will internally be working with uh, actual whole muscle equivalent products. So we're actually made some uh, tremendous advances in actually getting a product that is, looks, looks like fish taco meat. Um, so that's, that's what we'll be working on this year. Not ground version? Not ground. We're not in, so in the plant-based world, in the cell-based world, the first level of value added, good question, is hamburger meat, surimi. Going up on the meat side, you know, can, can, you, can you do ribeye steak? Challenging. Can you do salmon filet? Yes. Can you do scallops, crab meat? Yes. So, so it, you know, our opportunity to really go up the value chain is pretty significant you know, through a variety of, of processing techniques that we're not able to disclose. But, but to answer your question, you know, we're, we, we see ourselves being in a limited consumer market test some, somewhere in the three to four year time frame. Okay. So you solved the serum issue? We, we do have a solution for uh, FPS3. We're working on it. So, so we're, we've made a lot, of a, a lot of progress there as well. But he, he brought up the, uh, the fact that the traditional serum in industry is uh, FPS, is fetal, fetal bovine serum. It comes from an aborted calf um, that uh, is obviously an oxymoron for a product that is meant to not have any animal products in it. So the challenge that the industry has uh, is to actually replace that. And we've already had some, some some solutions that work and we're continually finding that to reduce the cost. It's, in addition to being what it is, it's also extremely costly. So it uh, has multiple barriers to being acceptable. But yes, it's from the man. So it's not really terribly well suited for our location. So the question was about regulatory labeling challenges. So uh, that's that's a question for others to ultimately solve. But I had the uh, the experience to actually uh, testify at both the FDA and the USDA, uh, which had some hearings, public hearings on it in 2018. Um, and there there clearly is some opposition on the meat side. As we as many of you may know, the state of Missouri, uh, there's actually like another half dozen states that are in various stages of combating. The, def the word meat uh, in both pl plant-based and a cell-based category uh, having some sort of a descriptor uh, that precedes that or does not use that word. We'll see what comes out of that. There's obviously GFI and others are already filing lawsuits against the states. So that battle will go on. But the good news is that the FDA will be regulating seafood for sure. Uh, uh, we believe with high confidence solely where the meat and poultry industry will be regulated which is very unusual by two agencies, FDA and USDA, which is uh, definitely peculiar, um, but it does make a lot of sense. And it's something I actually propose does make the most sense. But um, the good news also is they decided it won't be a legislative action to actually 
uh, oversee this, that the existing regulations um, provide a template from which industry can work with. So, you know, the Food Safety Modernization Act regulations will most likely apply here. Sir. Is your question about, um, uh, the, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question about the, the kind of equipment that will be required to use? Equipment, processes, inputs, like what do, you, what do you expect to change most, you know, in the next five years, three years, you know, whatever time frame, but like where do you see the most evolution? I'll, I'll, I'll start with the answer, Chris, to finish. I mean, to me, this is a, a combination of cell biology meets food manufacturing. So it's, it's a combination. So the way to actually do this is to actually manufacture the products. You know, the cell biology occurs here, and then the value added, smoking, grilling, uh, is very conventional as it is today. So, you know, at the end of the day, we're making a, let's call it a five ounce portion, a filet of salmon or whatever it might be, that then goes through various processes uh, downstream. So, um, if we think about yogurt or beer, so we have yeast, we have living cells producing stuff, and we're keeping them alive while they're producing this stuff. Uh, those cells are pretty tough. So you can kind of beat them up, pump them around, swish them around pretty easily. Um, animal cells are not as tough typically. So a couple decades ago, they developed something called uh, Chinese hamster ovary cell line. Sounds really about it. Um, it's a cute little hamster. Um, and uh, over time, they were able to, to really toughen up those cells. So they can take kind of all the abuse of the other piece of cells. Uh, so, all cells for the, for the land animals and for the sea animals also have this fragility kind of issue. Uh, but, so one of the things we've already made some really good progress on is essentially is toughening those guys up. So that means you can alter the kind of equipment that you use and the processes that uh, you subject them to to optimize your yield and speed of uh, development. But, the, but, but, but one answer to your question too is there's, a, just to make people aware of a couple upcoming conferences, there's a conference called Industrializing Cell-Based Meats here in San Francisco, February 5th to 7th, I believe. So if you're really interested in the commercialization aspect of this category, it's a really unique conference run by Hanson Wade out of the UK. And in March will be Future Food Tech, which is obviously a bit, you know, high level. Uh, but we'll have a little bit of topics, but the, the, but the one in February, industrial cell-based meats is a deep dive into this category. So I clearly recommend you guys come to that. I just really uh, amplify that point. I think this industry will succeed based on this manufacturing question, not so much as this taste or look like that. I think those are within the realm of respectability, but getting the price and the volumes uh, is really going to be really interesting. If you want to dive in, study. And, and, and it's also, I think, the, the industry, the media uses the word lab made, lab grown. There's no lab here. I come from the food industry. Yeah, we all work in a lab to begin with. We're, we're talking about factories. It's the same factory that makes any food product, whether it's, you know, you know crackers, cookies, yogurt, beer. Um, it's made in the factory, it starts in a lab, we're the same. So the whole concept of people wearing lab coats, showing a product at a really small microscopic level is not what this is about. It's all about factories that could be 100,000 square feet that are manufacturing products, you know, and, and really pumping it out. Other questions? Sir. The price we have right now in five years? <laughs> you have a crystal. You have a crystal ball with you. Do you have a crystal ball? No. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, so right now, you know, it's R and D. So it's not really. So right now is going to be small. Uh, I'd say where we need to go. Is uh, we think that it's, it makes sense to enter the market here as a premium. So people are paying for certain characteristics. Um, and so why does that make sense? If you look at canned tuna, for example, the cheapest canned tuna you can get at Walmart is about 28 cents a 
but two cans over from it, you can get a can that is five times as expensive. It still says can tuna. The only difference is on the expensive one it says, Dolphin say reduced mercury. Let's say that's true. You can't tell. In a blind case, you can tell which one is which. Right? So these are just words on a can. And then reduced, still really mad for you. Uh, dolphin safe, well, nothing is 100% dolphin safe. You see turtle safe or whatever. So you don't know, see plexiglossicity of 5x over 20 undetectable envelopes in the existing food space. So for us to come in and say there's no plastic, there's no mercury, there's no parasites, no clothes, all of these benefits. And a longer shelf life. Uh, we think it easily merits. So the supply, demand, pricing, tension will avail itself at that particular moment. Uh, and we'll have to co this in with uh, the production of the cost of capital to set up the factory for this so that's what needs to be advertised, and the patience of the markets to be able to fund things while this work is in So all of that will come into the launch. It's all about mass market, and, and we'll be doing consumer research to really understand the sensitivities and how best to communicate with the customer. But anyway, we're still around, and I want to thank you all for coming today. And uh, I think lunch is next. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this. Oh, oh. But enjoy. <laughs> question. Um, congrats on your raise over oh, the thanks. summer. And Hi. my question is, the Series A in the in the who, popper. Who are you with? Maiden Ventures. Oh, I think um, we're, I'm meeting you. Uh, on a phone, uh, maybe a Thursday. phone call. Well, there, um, there's a Thursday Sarah, meeting. Sarah, yeah. So, so we're, 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 we're in the middle of an A right now. 